when can things get back to normal in the past few weeks? That's the biggest question people seem to be asking. We want life to be the way it was before the pandemic. In reality, though, we know things may never be the same. Even getting close to life as we knew it is going to take some time. Good afternoon. I'm David Olajars, Manager of Media Relations at Henry Ford Health System. Welcome to today's edition of Facebook Live. Our discussion, our discussion today is about the new normal in healthcare and what that means for patients, their families, and even those who work in healthcare. Before we get started, a reminder to those watching to turn on your sound and to read our disclaimer at the top of this thread. For our discussion today, I'm pleased to have two returning guests, Dr. Betty Chu and Dr. Stephen Kalkanis. Dr. Chu is the chief, Dr. Chu is the associate chief clinical officer and chief quality officer at Henry Ford. She has also served as incident commander for the health system during the pandemic. By specialty, she is a practicing OBGYN physician. Dr. Kalkanis is CEO of the Henry Ford Medical Group and Chief of Clinical Academics at Henry Ford. He is also a nationally recognized neurosurgeon and chair of the Department of Neurosurgery. Welcome to you both. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Chu, I'd like to begin with you. So it's just been over about two months now since you appeared as our first guest on Facebook Live. Uh, looking back at where we were, how do you assess where we're at today? And have we turned a corner? Yeah. Well, thanks, Dave, for having us both today. Um, I uh, appreciate the time to speak to you and the group. Um, you know, I think we have turned a corner. Um, we certainly saw our peak in early April at our, as a health system and as a state. So um, I think we can all agree there's been a gradual and steady decline in the number of COVID patients. I'm, I would say we're not back to normal. You'll hear a lot from uh, Dr. Kalkanis that there's a long way to go until we get back to normal in terms of what we were like uh, before all this happened. And I'm sure all of us are feeling that personally. But, you know, I am optimistic, you know, about where we are currently right now. I think our teams are feeling a little bit of a sigh of relief related to the amount of stress uh, that they were experiencing. But really, uh, the confusion that persists in terms of their minds on what is the new normal and what does the new normal look like definitely is... Uh, uh, something that we're all working through right now. And Dr. Kalkanis, you, you also were uh, one of our early Facebook Live guests. What are your thoughts on where we've, what we've just been through? Well, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to be with you. Uh, this is our 10th week of uh, a new normal that we're living in. And uh, like Dr. Chu, I'm thrilled that not only have we turned a corner, but I think we are firmly in a recovery phase now. In many ways, the recovery phase is uh, challenging, uh, sometimes even more challenging log logistically than when this crisis first hit us, but we are prepared. We've had significant lessons learned and uh, our teams are ready. And, and I think that in particular, uh, our patients understand that this is a, a place that, that safety is prioritized above all else. And we have some very good news to share. Uh, we are testing all patients who come in for a procedure. And over the weekend, uh, the hundreds of people that we've uh, been preparing for this coming week, 0% have tested positive. These are people coming in from the community. We also, for the first time, are testing uh, small groups of our employees as part of a trial, and 0% uh, have tested positive. We haven't been able to say that in, in a very, very long time. So uh, more than glimmers of hope, but despite the weather, rays of sunshine, and uh, you know, I, I, I think that uh, we can all breathe a sigh of relief, uh, at least for now. That's really good. Um, for these next series of questions, um, these will be for you, Dr. Kalkanis. So during your, during your March Facebook Live, you talked about how it became necessary for Henry Ford to stop non-time sensitive procedures and services. Moving forward now, where do we stand on these types of services and what are the challenges of bringing them back online? Thanks, David. So uh, I want to say that we are, we are now in our fourth week of ramping up uh, 
time sensitive cases uh, and elective cases. And this is our first full week of ramping up elective cases. So at the beginning, we had to uh, postpone uh, cases that were not uh, critical or time sensitive. But I would remind our, our viewers that Henry Ford Health System never really stopped performing you know, life-saving surgeries and procedures for, for those patients who, who needed it the most. And now we're just layering on top of that uh, additional capabilities. And the preparations have been uh, dramatic. Uh, every single patient who comes in for uh, these procedures now is getting a viral PCR nasal swab test. Uh, the results are back within a few hours. They come in two days before uh, they're, they're tracked and then they're scheduled for, for their surgery uh, the following day. Uh, our teams are prepared. We've totally revamped the scheduling process to allow for social and physical distancing and so forth when people come in. And of course, all along, uh, actually, our ORs have been probably the safest place in Michigan in terms of the sterility uh, that was already being followed. But now uh, that's even to an, an enhanced degree. So uh, we also realize, and this is an important point, I think, for viewers listening at home, that nine, ten weeks ago, you may have had a condition that was not deemed, quote, time sensitive or urgent, but 10 weeks later, some of those more elective cases now become more urgent because, you know, COVID doesn't get to put everything on hold and, and diseases progress. So we're well aware of that. And we've, uh, that's why we've begun now that we can do so safely with ramping up these cases. With these uh, cases starting to ramp up, are any of those impacted by the governor's existing executive order? We've been in constant communication with Governor Whitmer and her team. And in fact, I'm very grateful to our local, state, and national leaders for calling on Henry Ford uh, as, as a source of reference, truth, and advice. And, and they've been following our recommendations in that there's actually a lot of flexibility for patients with uh, medical problems to come into our centers as long as we can demonstrate that this is of medical need. And obviously, uh, all of our patients who are being brought in do have medical need. Uh, we are fully within uh, the governor's uh, orders. We know that things are going to take time to sort of ramp up, right? Um, can, can you talk about the phasing in approach that Henry Ford is taking, uh, how things are being prioritized, and how long it might take before uh, the health system is fully operational? Yeah, these are great questions, and uh, we're developing many pathways simultaneously, but I'll tell you that in the middle of March, we had to postpone approximately 8,000 procedures. And luckily we've gone through every single one of those procedures and assigned sort of a, an urgency or a priority score. Actually, and this was done by talking directly to the patients, the physicians and the nurses and the, the, the patients communicate regularly to see how people are doing and if they're able to wait or not. And based on this tiered approach, we've now scheduled all of these tier one patients and we're moving on to tier two and tier three. And so we hope uh, by the end of June, we'll have gone through most of that backlog, understanding that at the same time, there are new patients coming in with new conditions that have to be scheduled. So um, we are bringing sites online as soon as we can demonstrate safety. And Dr. Chu and her team have really been national and international leaders in, in how to do this. And so as we bring up more capability, we intend to have extended hours for patients. So really all of our ambulatory sites going from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., we're adding Saturday surgeries, even Sundays uh, when applicable so that we, uh, we can reach as many people as we can, but only when we're certain that we have the testing capability and that we can do it safely. We have a couple of viewer questions already. This one comes from Kathy. She's asking about our transplant clinic and what should people expect any sort of changes in that particular clinic? Thanks for your great question, Kathy. And it's very timely because uh, many of you may have seen a very heartwarming story where we performed a heart transplant just in time for Mother's Day where a mother could really uh, get a new lease on life and spend it with her family. We've done two liver transplants. We've done multiple craniotomies and brain surgeries. So these very complex clinics and patients who may be immunocompromised, we've found a way to do this safely. And so I don't think that you're going to notice any major change other than the physical distancing and the testing that, that we've already talked about. But I know that Dr. Chu is going to talk about our, our site readiness and, and safety programs as well. And this question comes up, uh, how will physicals work? And are there any differences in going for, for lab work? 
in the coming weeks and months ahead. Well, maybe this is a good time to transition to Dr. Chu, who uh, has really led some of these uh, efforts in, in bringing people in safely. Dr. Chu, would you like to take that question? Yeah, uh, you know, in terms of laboratory testing and also um, entryway really into those ambulatory facilities to have procedures done, I think this sort of speaks to what Steve was referencing, which is we have the, what we're calling the Henry Ford promise. And as a part of that promise, we're really trying to make sure that we have a consistent commitment to a few key elements. One is we are encouraging, um, of course, all of our employees, or we have a universal mask policy for all of our employees, but that does extend to visitors coming to our facilities. We're really focusing on social distancing and ensuring that there's enough spacing between uh, our visitors as well as our employees. Um, screening all of our employees and visitors as they come into facilities with not only uh, temperature screening, but also symptom screening. And then we're really taking a really rigorous effort to ensure that we continually disinfect surfaces. So in terms of safety coming into our laboratory facilities or any any of our other uh, facilities, we've really um, made a concerted effort to ensure that we have these key elements um, in addition to other safe practices to ensure that uh, there's a good environment when folks are coming in. What will be the process, Dr. Chu, if, if any patients arrive and display symptoms related to COVID? Yeah, we will, well, we will um, ask them to, we've got a couple options for patients who are coming in. One is we can help assist setting up a televisit for those patients, but additionally, again, depending on how acutely sick the patient is, we can certainly always send them to an urgent care or one of our emergency departments. Um, our goal would be, of course, to not have that person come into the facility. Um, the same is true with employees. Part of that screening process is if the employee comes in and has a temperature or is screened and found to have some symptoms, uh, they'll be turned away from coming into the facility, but certainly want to make sure that employee gets the care they need uh, through employee health, and they'll be directed to employee health to have additional testing or screening. Dr. Kalkanis, uh, you spoke earlier about the operating room. Uh, we know there is a lot of moving parts involved in managing an, an operating room schedule. What's the process for rescheduling these surgeries and procedures that were postponed? Well, it's a very complex one, but one that thankfully we have uh, uh, some experience with and we know it's gone smoothly over the last couple of weeks. Uh, over the last 10 days, for instance, uh, since we started this mandatory testing, we've uh, performed about 2,000 surgeries. And what will happen is that uh, a member of our team will call the patient and bring them in and schedule uh, them for a viral PCR COVID test that'll be done at one of our uh, outpatient facilities that are spread geographically around Southeast Michigan for convenience. Uh, that test will be scheduled. The results will be followed up on. A nurse will call that patient back uh, by the next morning. Uh, hopefully that test will be negative and then that patient will be scheduled for a specific time slot the following day for surgery. And again, all of the instructions for uh, what to expect when you arrive, as Dr. Chu mentioned, and the universal mask policy, our visitor policy, and, and social and physical distancing, all of that will, uh, will be in place. And th th does this also apply to things like mammograms, heart scans, colonoscopy, things like that? Uh, so, uh, the efforts like, uh, you know, bringing back our ambulatory services are ramping up uh, at the end of this week and end of last week, this week and, and next week. So you're going to be hearing more about that, but that will be coming back online as well. Not everyone getting a test uh, like a radiology test is going to get a viral PCR swab. This is really for patients who are going to the operating room, uh, but every patient is going to have universal screening when they come in to make sure that they don't have symptoms. We do temperature checks, universal masks, and so forth. This question comes in from Maria, uh, Dr. Chu. Do we have a sense yet of when ophthalmology and optimized offices may reopen? Yeah, well, those are two different things. So, you know, our optimized, which is our retail um, uh, services that we provide, um, again, whether those are considered essential or not will be de determined by the kinds of uh, a procedure. So the optimized is a little bit more delayed. Ophthalmology, of course, has many medical and sensitive types of things that those folks need to see. So knowing that ophthalmology is something, again, um, in our system, uh, underneath the Henry Ford Medical Group, we have a very large and robust ophthalmology department. I'd imagine, and again, I defer to Steve, that no different than other clinical services, they're taking into consideration what kinds of services they are offering um, and what, which ones of those are considered time sensitive and necessary at this point. 
In the past few months, we saw the number of virtual visits really soar across the health system, and patients really embraced that, that type of technology. That being said, uh, what can patients expect to, when, when can patients expect to, to start seeing their doctor or specialist in person? No, Steve, Dr. Dr. You yeah, go ahead, Steve. I don't know if you wanted okay. to take that. Sure, yeah. sure. Well, you know, virtual visits uh, actually is something we're very excited about. It's one of the, the silver linings of COVID, as it were. You know, before this challenge started, we were doing about 150 a week. Uh, now we're doing 10,000. So we've shown that uh, our patients, our members of the community, referring physicians, uh, everyone is getting comfortable with this type of interaction. And I think that certainly that does not replace uh, many uh many in-person visits that are still needed, but it's going to be an option that we continue long after this crisis phase of COVID is over. And as we speak, uh, arrangements are being made to bring in patients to our ambulatory sites for in-person visits uh, for those who need them the most. And so we're prioritizing uh, based on the severity of illness and if you know certain things need to be done that can only be done in person. Uh, but we've heard from many of our patients who've been pleasantly surprised uh, that it was easy to, to log in and, and, and it was convenient. They didn't have to get in their car and drive or you know, navigate a hospital and so forth. And so I think that um, there's many lessons learned about how we can optimize virtual visits, but still also add back in the in-person ones, which are, are happening now. Dr. Kalkanis, um, are hip replacements part of those procedures that are coming back online? They will be very soon, including this week and next week. And of course, hip replacements uh, are uh, come in many different shapes and sizes because patients who have uh, intractable pain and can't walk, if there's an issue with infection or, or you know, a new fracture or a new injury, then those are not things that can wait. But if this has been a problem that's been you know, brewing for years and years, and this was a scheduled procedure, uh, we felt it probably safer uh, a couple months ago to push this off and, and wait till things calm down. And that time is now, uh, but uh, that wasn't in the first wave of prioritizations like cancer surgeries and transplants and so forth, but we are getting to those very soon. Dr. Chu, I'd like to uh, shift the conversation now to the safeguards that Henry Ford is putting into place to protect the safety and health of its patients, visitors, and team members. So what steps are being taken that will do just that and to minimize any spread of uh, potential infection? Sure. Uh, some of the things that I had mentioned a little bit earlier around what we call the Henry Ford promise related to social distancing and screening and universal masking. Additionally, though, if you think about um, in some of the areas that people historically gather, which are, the, are in lobbies and in uh, preoperative waiting areas, we're really trying to continue with um, a limitation on the visitors currently right now. One, because of the executive order that, uh, that, that mandates that we need to limit the number of visitors coming to our facilities. But we'll really be doing some considerable thinking about how many visitors do we need to have in our facilities because it may lead to crowding in some of our lobbies and some of our waiting room areas. Um, so that'll be one of the things that we'll certainly are looking at very closely to maintain that social distancing. Other areas like elevators, um, ensuring that we have adequate spacing in elevators. Um, you'll, uh, visitors will notice that there'll be signage on the floor of the elevators, really asking folks where to stand and position themselves in the elevator. Um, we're also gonna be limiting the number of uh, people going on to an elevator again, all in an effort to uh, reduce the amount of exposure that folks have to each other. Um, the biggest thing that I'd really strongly encourage is for visitors to wear a mask. Uh, we're finding that sometimes it's, uh, it's difficult to comply to that, um, and we understand that um, people are getting tired of wearing masks um, outside, uh, certainly, um, and in the external environment, not inside of a closed facility. Um, but once you're in a closed facility in one of our healthcare facilities, um, it is important for um, all visitors to wear uh, masks while they're in the facility. So we're continuing looking at all of our processes to ensure that uh, our patient center employees are safe. How does how do, we, how do we keep that social distancing, Dr. Chu, when it comes to an inpatient doctor's appointment? Obviously, you know, the, the doctor needs to examine the patient. Um, so are there any particular precautions being taken inside that, uh, inside that exam room? 
Well, a couple key things, of course, when you're having direct contact with a patient, which invariably has to happen in order for us to do a physical assessment or examination, um, that the importance of hand washing, of using hand sanitizer, um, those types of practices, making sure that we disinfect the room and clean the room uh, thoroughly following a patient being in the room. Again, um, wearing of masks, um, uh, where it makes sense for folks to wear masks inside of a closed proximal space. Uh, clearly, if you're a provider and you're examining a physician, examining somebody's nose or mouth, you would require them to take off their mask, um, but um, trying to limit the amount of exposure uh, that folks have. Again, um, if we're screening all of our employees, if we're screening all of our patients, we'll have a sense of whom has a high likelihood of having some sort of a disease. Somebody who's completely asymptomatic, who's coming in, and again, in my world, for a, a well baby check or a well pregnancy check, and they have no symptoms, no fever, um, no sense of COVID, um, you know, we want to be reasonable, of course, when we're, we're a physician examining a patient. Um, and we, we may need to, of course, um, do a physical exam of that patient. And so we want to use uh, reasonableness when we're doing that. And what about the essential visitor policy, which is different than what we had in place for the last several weeks? How does that work for patients who want to bring a spouse, family member, companion uh, with them to an appointment or procedure? Yes, it's, it's a good point. Right now, again, as you know, the governor's orders are changing very rapidly in terms of the executive orders we just found today. And we were just talking before this about Northern Michigan sort of opening up some of its uh, policies in Northern Michigan. Um, we're looking closely at our visitor policy, that essential visitor policy, which used to be much more restrictive. Now, as we open our ambulatory clinics and have many more surgical patients, as you just heard, coming through, those surgical patients right now are really limited to having one visitor with them. Um, the question becomes, as we start getting more uh, patients and more families that want to come, when somebody's having a major event, like a transplant surgery, um, and if they want to bring one or two or three people with them, we're going to really have to think about what does that look like and how long after the governor's order uh, uh, gets rescinded, how long do we continue to restrict the number of visitors um, in our surgical waiting areas, um, especially before there's a vaccine? especially before I think all of us feel completely safe. So um, I don't have a, a great answer for you now because again, it's a, it's a fluid situation. We're really trying to assess what's uh, best for our patients and what keeps us the most safe. Um, at the same time, we recognize that from an experience perspective, uh, when you have a major event, like again, a major surgery or delivering a baby, having family and visitors around is really important to people. Dr. Kalkanis, some people have said they won't go see a doctor or go to a hospital until there is a vaccine that becomes available. How can you reassure those folks about this new normal that we're, that we're living right now and the consequences, of course, of avoiding medical care? This might be one of the, the most important things that we talk about today and in the days ahead, because I've been uh, in receipt of some data that concerns me, and that is that patients who are having chest pain or stroke-like symptoms or very serious illnesses are somehow not coming to an emergency room or not seeking care for fear of COVID. This is absolutely not what they should be doing. I, I want everyone to understand that our emergency rooms, our physician offices, our our facilities are absolutely safe, and there is no better place for you to be if you're exhibiting any kind of serious symptoms or worried about a life-threatening illness that, that you seek immediate medical attention. Because uh, again, COVID does not change the fact that this is why we're here. This is how we're built. This is what we're prepared for. And uh, we can't help you if you don't come and, and, and let us uh, give the care that we're trained to give. And so, um, everything that you heard about from Dr. Chu, everything that you're seeing uh, online in terms of what to expect at Henry Ford and, 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 and beyond uh, really is, is for everyone's protection, but specifically, do not delay if you have any serious concerns because you know your life could depend on it and uh, th there's no reason to uh, be concerned for safety at, at our facilities. Yeah, I, I, would, I would add a little bit to Steve too. You know, what's different about our industry is that We've been fully open and operational, um, albeit some parts of our, our business have been less busy, but we've been fully open and operational through the entire crisis. So compared to other 
perhaps companies or industries, they haven't had to put all these practices in place, the screening, the cleaning, the disinfection, the, the mask usage, but we've had a lot of practice uh, at this for the past couple of months. So I would, I would venture to say that going into a hospital or an ambulatory facility right now in a healthcare facility is perhaps safer than going into a lot of other facilities because we've been practicing this for quite some time now and have had um, a lot of success in keeping our employees safe. Um, the rate of infection in our employees is exceptionally low. Uh, we've been very successful in making sure people have adequate PPE and supplies. We have a very adequate supply of PPE, uh, not only for our uh, employees, but also when visitors come in, they'll be issued a mask if they need a mask. So I, I uh, would encourage the public to consider that, uh, you know, healthcare facilities at this point are quite safe because we've been at this for a while now. Absolutely. This uh, question comes from Cindy. There are patients arriving who do not speak English. How will the symptom survey be conducted for those patients to assess their risk for COVID? Yeah, it, it's a great question, Dave. And we've actually taken that into consideration. Um, we've had a lot of experience, of course, with interpreter services, making sure that um, the most common languages are always uh, a part of not only our my chart and our EPIC and our discharge summaries, but to your point, when they come through our screening, um, we've taken the most commonly spoken languages and those documents have been translated into those languages, whether it be Arabic or Spanish or what have you, based on, again, the region and location uh, of those screening sites. So they are in uh, multi-languages. And I would just underscore a point that uh, has been made time and again, and that is we have the luxury of not having to reinvent uh, ourselves in this regard because patients from all around the world come to Henry Ford every day long before COVID. So we've had interpreter uh, services in place. We've had multi-cultural uh, uh, outreaches going on. And so we're, we, we have this covered for sure. It's an excellent question. So before we close our, our uh, discussion today, I'd like to thank both of you for joining us. And just wanted to ask for any, any of your final thoughts um, for, the, uh, for what to expect in the coming weeks and months. Dr. Chu, would you like to go first? Uh, well, I would say uh, it's a new normal uh, for all of us. Um, I think, uh, you know, as a, as a person who's a part of a healthcare system, uh, we're uh, excited about the kinds of innovation that might come out of the crisis that just occurred. And we continue to make sure that we stay focused on patient and employee safety. I think every single one of us has that commitment. Um, my observation would be like everybody else, I can't wait to go to a restaurant. <laughs> And uh, I can't wait uh, for my kids to be able to visit with other kids so I can get them out of my hair a little bit. So, I mean, outside of that, I would say I think we're all just adjusting to a new normal. And, um, you know, we are, um, uh, I, I'm just really proud of our organization because we've taken such a thoughtful and a deliberate approach to everything that we've done. Dr. Calcanis. Thank you. And I would agree wholeheartedly with Dr. Chu. I would also say that, you know, when you go through tough times, you know, you learn through that experience who you can count on. And we can count on the healthcare heroes who came to work every day against all odds. We can count on the most wonderful community that Henry Ford could ever ask for from Southeast Michigan to the state of Michigan to this country and this world when Detroit became a hotspot. The partnership with corporate and industry and so many other partners from a philanthropic standpoint, from an outreach standpoint. And we hope to really uh, solidify these relationships and continue to be that, that trusted partner for healthcare across the board. And, and I guess uh, I would also uh, end with by, uh, by, by really remembering uh, kind of the words of Winston Churchill at the end of World War II. He said, you know, we may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. And so we, we've come through this together right now and we're, we're at a spot where we can breathe again. But let us not forget for a moment that uh, we have a lot of effort that lies ahead. And so we are actively preparing and we're ready. Uh, but I think uh, it's, it's through partnership with so many people across our system and our teams. And uh, I'm so grateful to be part of Henry Ford and wonderful to have a chance to be with all of you today. That's a very good note to end on, Dr. Calcanis. Thank you. I also want to thank our viewers for watching and for, 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 and for their questions. For information about the new normal at Henry Ford, look for that information on henryford.com. 
And finally, stay safe, stay healthy, and have a good afternoon. Great. Thank you. Thank you.